Let's go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, Master Keys, our master Bible study. Uh, uh, our church is in Cleveland, Ohio. You can find us at se the number seven day dot org, and this is an advanced class for those who just enjoy digging a little deeper, probably deeper than some would want to go. Uh, this is lesson two, module two of the story of redemption. You can find the previous episodes on YouTube under Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church or at our website. You can watch it in either place and catch up and enjoy. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we're gonna get into part two of the story of redemption. Oh, there's my buddy. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for how you continue to bless us with your word and insight on how to rightly divide the word. Visit us with your spirit and your wisdom tonight is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. The story of redemption, part two. Now, in part one, it was a clear illustration of what we had talked about at the end of lesson one in the beginning. We introduced the concept of hermeneutics. But before we get into what happened in the last <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Something you can mute yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry, I had to mute you because we're recording. You can always unmute yourself when you're ready to make a comment. All right, so here is are the master keys for lesson two, the story of redemption. Have no idea how many modules or how many lessons it's gonna take to get through uh, lesson two but that's the fun part, right? Here's what we are learning in the story of redemption. The innocence of Adam and Eve, number two, the components of temptation, number three, the seriousness of death, and number four, the importance of the Sabbath. Last week, we began to cover the innocence of Adam and Eve, and we ran into uh, some struggles, and it was expected because I had just started to introduce hermeneutics to you and the importance of hermeneutics. Remember, I showed you this particular uh, resource, uh, biblical hermeneutics. I'll be using it throughout, showing you different things from it. Uh, one of the most important components of hermeneutics, meaning understanding the scripture is that a thing can never mean what it never meant. So when we're talking about biblical principles, we're trying to draw out what the author intended for us to get. The author is impressed or inspired by God to document something for our learning. And when we're dealing with um, now Moses, uh, imagine it this way. Moses spending all that time up on the mount, and the Lord is telling him about what happened in the beginning, and he's writing it. So whose story is it really? It is God's story, right? And so what happened to us last week, and I really want all of you to go back and listen to it. What happened to us is we could not get past how we feel if it would have happened today. Now, there is a place for that because that's ultimately what God wants us to consider. But as it is, is expressed to us through the word of God, the story has to be in the context of who it happened to, not in the context of how we see it from today's language, today's culture, today's attitudes, today's resources. We must only see it from their language, their culture, their resources, and their attitudes. And so that's when we're getting the most out of it. And we talked about this at the end of module one. And, and remember this image, right? Everybody who was there, who was not there, don't worry about it. We'll catch you up. This is the image that, said, that, that is what we're trying to get past. 
Uh, for instance, I can put in this image um, in the center here, the word gay. How I see everything associated with the word gay is based on how gay is perceived today. Someone in 1921, if you put gay in the center and start telling them stories, everything they believe about it would be completely different than how I see it because I am from a different time and from a different culture. And so if I'm reading a story about gay from 1921, then I must dismiss what it means today and investigate what it meant to him or her who's writing the story. Any questions about that? Okay, so last week, I asked a pivotal question and it was provocative. It was setting you up. And that question uh, was in reference to, should Eve have had the conversation with the serpent? And uh, it was intended to light your fire, <laughs> right? And we have all been exposed to the civil rights movement. We've all been exposed to the remnants of the feminist movement and what is happening today in, uh, in current uh, culture and atmosphere. And we struggled to see it from the point of view of Adam and Eve in the garden and all those days that they uh, spent with Jesus versus how we would see it if it happened today. And, uh, and it was a fun struggle because it was very educational. But what we want to do is before we leap into how to apply it today, we can't put the cart before the horse. We have to apply it in the way that is intended by the writer, okay? So uh, today I wanna give you a little bit more on hermeneutics before we dive back into uh, Genesis, okay? So uh, I'll begin with textual analysis. And this won't take but a few minutes to just go through this to give us some, some, some context. Textual analysis evaluates the various readings of the extant manuscripts in an effort to ascertain the earliest form of the text. Basically what I just told you is textual analysis. How do we figure out what the text is trying to tell us? And that comes from this book I've been sharing with you, Biblical Hermeneutics. The Adventist Approach, page 77. The geological principle, what is that? The version of the reading from which the other readings could most easily have developed is likely the original. So we're trying to figure out where did this interpretation come from, from this interpretation, from this interpretation. And what we're trying to do is get to the beginning. And, and as I said before, I don't want you to try to memorize everything I'm showing you and saying. I want you to just absorb it for a minute. And as we apply it, then it'll start making much more sense. So what we're trying to do, there are many, many copies of manuscripts from the Bible. What we believe is the originals or closest to the originals is what we're trying to get to. So over the course of time through Hebrew history from the Septuagint, the captivity in Babylon, unto um, after the uh, Roman captivity, the burning of the temple and all of that stuff in AD 70, there are many scribes who took what was dictated to them and wrote it down. And whatever survived, somebody makes a copy of that. And all of those copies are handwritten. And every time a copy is made, um, there is an interpretation based on the time and context that the scribe has. So the scribe for Elijah is not going to have the same attitude as the scribe for Daniel or the scribe for John the Revelator. Based on what has taken place over the course of history, that scribe is going to see a text differently than the scribes before him. 
Any questions on that? All right, all right, everybody's quiet. I'm just gonna keep on because I wanna get through this. Lectio difficilio. That's just Latin for, man, that was hard. <laughs> it means the most difficult reading is most likely the original. The most difficult reading is most likely the original. Let's look at um, manuscripts coming out of Alexandria, Egypt, or coming out of a cave, or wherever it is. Uh, think of them as newspapers that have been collected for years. Think about your worst hoarder ever. And they've been collecting newspapers for years. A newspaper so old, you don't see the dates on them anymore. All you have is little pieces of the newspaper. Some of them were the first time telling the story and the other editions of the paper were the anniversary revised editions, but you can't tell which is which. And you got all these newspapers in front of you. How do you know which one is the original? Well, the language that it speaks in, it gives the context clues of which one is more likely the original writing. The easier it is to read, the more modern it is, is basically what I'm saying. All right, so here's errors with a question mark. Sometimes, whether intentional or unintentionally, it appears that material was added by scribes. None of these additions affected the truth of the Bible, nor are they difficult to recognize by diligent students, meaning you and me. And you say, well, how is the Bible inspired by God? And there could be errors easily. And I'm going to show you some examples. Here is Luke chapter four, 11, verse 4. And forgive us our sins. Talking about the Lord's Prayer, right? And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is, you see the word, indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, well, now that's the physician's version of this. Now here's Matthew's version of the same text and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is someone's account of the same words of Jesus, but they use slightly different language. Luke says, right? Luke says this belief, believes to be a friend of Peter and all that. We're not get into all that right now. We will, but not now. Luke says, forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Matthew says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, our debtors. And you say, well, that's no real difference. Well, it depends on who's reading it. Anybody want to take a crack at what the difference might be? Well, y'all go and listen to me till we get, you just want to get back to Genesis. We going? <laughs> All right, everybody's quiet, so I'm just going to keep on talking. I'm going to give you another example. Here's Matthew 15 and verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This is Matthew recording something Jesus was saying in a speech to them. Now, for the Hebrew, he hears this differently than you and I would hear it. When Matthew hears Jesus, if he doesn't quote this text precisely, he believes he's going to help Jesus out by writing it or filling in what Jesus didn't quote. Now, what do you mean? Here is the original text. See, you and I may read, hear it, and we're thinking Jesus is just giving us some precious truths, but a contemporary would hear it, and they would hear Isaiah 29, 13. Wherefore the Lord says, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Now let's go back to what Jesus said. He didn't say anything about removing the heart, nor did he say the precept of men. 
But if a scribe heard Jesus, he would go, oh, I know. I know what he's saying. The rest of it is implied, and I'm going to fill it in. Does everybody understand, or does anybody understand what I'm trying to tell you about manuscripts? Mm -hmm. I heard a, a subtle little mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> When you like, is that kind of like the express or implied concept when dealing with um in in the legal field in law? Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. That's a good example, Donna. That's exactly what is happening. As a scribe, when I hear you, for instance, if if I'm preaching, and I and I start to to quote Jeremiah twenty nine eleven but I call it Isaiah 29, 11, right? And you know what I meant. So when you're telling your friend about what I preach, you're going to correct it. You're gonna say, this is what pastor was quoting. You see what I'm saying? Because you have context. When you hear that quote is familiar to you, even if I give the wrong book and verse, you know what I meant. This is how scribes can change something from one copy of a manuscript to another because they're assuming that you're quoting it from an original source and they're gonna add that in. Or say for instance, I quote right chapter and verse, but I get part of the quote wrong. It is only human nature for me to try to help you or human need for you to try to help me and write it correctly. You see? Well, so then I have a question. Sure. So then, so then isn't that like um, changing? You know, it, scripture tells you don't add anything to this word or take it away or else you're in trouble. Isn't that the same thing? Well, but the person who is, yeah, but the person who is writing it, this, that's exactly what they're thinking. That... This, this text I'm using in front of you. When Jesus is preaching in Matthew 15, the scribe would say, well, I got to write that correctly like it was in Isaiah 29, 13, because I can't let Jesus change Isaiah 29, 13. You see what I'm saying, Donna? Okay. All right. Yeah. It's now, kind of like splitting hairs, though. Yeah, but that is what's, that's what rightly dividing the word is all about. It is splitting hairs. Because for them, as it should be for us, it's as serious as a heart attack. And I want to get it precisely correct. When they would uh, recite someone else's speech, they would, do, they would learn the hand gestures, the inflection of the voice, everything. If I'm going to preach Isaiah, I'm going to be a hologram of Isaiah. That's the way they looked at it because they didn't just want to get the words right. They want to get how we said it right. That's why to this day, word of mouth is more reliable than the written word. Because that's how seriously they took it from the beginning until this very day. They go to a synagogue and see how that goes. You know, they ain't playing with this. And, but there can be human nature can make false assumptions or it could reach too far trying to interpret. And I'm gonna show you that in just a second, okay? Uh, so how do we make sure we get it right? We just talked about internal evidence, meaning that we try to, uh, we try to associate with uh, what somebody is saying with what has already been said what somebody is teaching versus what we already know about the word. That's internal evidence. External evidence is the actual physical manuscripts. And uh, trust me, I won't go too far with this because I'm just trying to introduce you to it so that we can use these concepts in our lessons. External evidence is interpretation of physical manuscripts. Uh, they are placed in three categories. Alexandrian, Alexandrian, Byzantine, and Western. And I'm gonna give you a real easy way to remember each of them, okay? Alexandrian, Byzantine, and Western. Alexandrian, 
stems from scribes, schooled, and Alexandrian scriptorial practices. What is that? It emphasized the accurate transmission of manuscripts. What this mean, Alexandrian, Alexandrian mean Alexandria, Egypt. This is the original school of the prophets. These are the descendants of, remember Elijah was taking Elisha around to all these schools of the prophets when he was getting ready to ascend up into heaven or taken away by the chariot. This is that practice. It's, it mostly deals with the way the Old Testament was interpreted. And basically, long story short, Alexandrian is easier to remember like this. It's not my job to interpret it. It's my job to write exactly what was said. It doesn't have to make sense to me because it's Holy Ghost inspired. So I don't have the right to change a single letter. That's Alexandrian. All right, everybody got that? Okay. So what is Western then? Western would be, and I've put up this up here to help you, old Latin, right? This is your prescription drugs, right? <laughs> this is, uh, uh, do you take in your high my climate type of scene? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's Western. Western doesn't mean like we mean West today, we would say England, America. That's not what, that wasn't their world. Their world, West was Greece and Rome that was considered to be Western. So we're now talking about going into the early stages of what would become Catholicism and those monks and scribes, uh, Latin being the most common language. And it's a simple language and they tended to paraphrase. They tended to try to help the text out a little bit, but oftentimes keeping original text that didn't need help. Uh, I gave you some examples of what that could look like, like the NIV versus the King James. The King James would be Alexandrian. The NIV would be Western. You see what I'm saying? The uh, NRSV, you see me use that a lot. Uh, that would probably be considered like Western, meaning it's easier to follow for modern people, but it does not keep the integrity of direct translation from Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and not trying to fill in any articles, any anything, that would be Alexandrian. Western would be trying to help you out, help it go smoother. Any questions about that before we go forward? No need to get a headache. We're gonna do this again and again and again until it's old hat, don't worry, okay? Uh, Deacon King man. Yes, it's... Um... Is an example like how you're talking to us, mm -hmm. and and I'm sitting down writing what you're saying, mm -hmm. and then I put it in the form that we are to not get the translations confused because we, instead of you saying, well, as the original author or speaker, you use the word you in your mm -hmm. speech. But me as the writer, I'll say we are to get the get it straight. And I'll change the instead of using you, I'll put we in there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's where I'm getting the 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 Western from the Alexander, mm -hmm. where Scribe would change it and include himself because he's not or she's not the speaker, but just this. The, the 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 scribe right right and 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 that was done really a lot with uh with new testament more so than old testament and that that's mm -hmm. yeah that's right you're you're trying to record it in a way that you get it when you go back over your notes yes that's what you're saying yeah yeah that's that's correct yeah 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 almost seems... done with this part go ahead go ahead you saw i'm sorry were you done it seems like when we have this knowledge that you just gave us, that the impact of the message has a deeper grasping of our clarity or comprehension. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you. That. Thank you. 
Thank you. The whole reason we're doing this is when you recognize where the translator is coming from, then you know how to approach it. That's, that's all we're doing is learning how to approach scripture. Okay, so the last one is Byzantine. And this one uh, we, we are very much acquainted with. Uh, it is the later dated manuscripts. We're going back and now we're really into the time where the Catholic church is the universal church. And they have all these people who are doing nothing but translating. And now the more common languages, uh, such as the trader language, we call it English, right? It was a language of trade. It's shorthand language. That's what it is. So people could do business with each other in coastal areas. Um, it, it has an impact now on how scripture is interpreted. You know one that we use all the time. Jesus says to the thief on the cross, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Okay, well, with the Byzantine point of view, uh, I'm going to put a comma behind uh, today, uh, 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 in, uh, in, in, in front of today. But with the Alexandria, uh, with the, the um, Western interpretation, I'm going to put a comma behind today. So Byzantine would say, put it in front. I say, I say to you, pause, today you're going to be with me in paradise. The Western point of view would say, I say to you today, pause, you will be with me in paradise. But the Alexandrian point of view would say, don't put a comma anywhere because there's not a comma there. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not putting a comma anywhere from the Alexandrian point of view because there's no articles like that. What I'm well, going what to makes do, us, hmm? what makes us, What makes us get that concept of the comma either before today or after today? Because modern doctrine is forming mm -hmm. when these manuscripts are being copied. And so I cannot separate what I believe from my religion okay. to what, from what's being read on the paper. And so now, even though I'm not intending to, I'm infusing my beliefs into my copying of the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And it, it is it really a subconscious thing. It's not intentional because these are God-fearing people just trying to do a good job. It was as if one of us as an Adventist had to copy a manuscript. That's what I'm like, no, it can't mean that. It has to mean this because I have my religion ingrained in me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can't tell the difference between our religion and the plain word of God is we're affected by it. We, it's like when people put words upside down and say, read this sentence, your mind turns it right back side up and read it, or they take the spaces out and you can still read it because it's already ingrained into you to see things a certain way. <clears throat> you know, no matter what meat they give you, if you don't know what it is, it's going to take like chicken because I'm associating it by chicken. <laughs> Right? It's the same thing. Same thing. So you see this last line down here. The scribe tends to try to improve the text mm -hmm. rather than leave it less clear. If it's not clear, the scribe is tempted to improve it. And that's where we can get uh, into trouble. Okay? So then how do you resolve this, this, this mess? How do you resolve it? investigating the original meaning of words and cross-referencing with how they are used in other scriptures will generally yield the proper understanding. Because we go by a principle. The Bible is not going to contradict itself. So I find other instances of how this word or phrase or doctrine has been applied and it will tell me the overall meaning of where I'm engaging it in the text. So what is the answer? Use internal and external keys. And you say, well, man, that, that probably sound, I should have said that from the beginning, right? But it wouldn't have no meaning if I would have just went here without taking you through the other different options. 
And so this is what we call rightly dividing the word, right? This is why the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist church in all of his existence has not been able to be dismantled because our prophet, when she does exegesis, when she uses hermeneutics in uh, the conflict series, um, she applies what I just showed you. She uses both internal, meaning scripture versus scripture, external, let me see the manuscript. What does the original manuscript say? When you put those two principles together, you have a cross-reference and you can never go wrong when you cross-reference. This why, no matter uh, this, this prophet that we have, has written far more than any other uh, uh, so-called prophet of any church, and yet this church stands strong because it's standing on all the word of God, not cherry picking based on what we have brought to the text. Instead, she goes into the text and pulls out instead of bringing her biases to the text and add to. Any questions about that? Uh, I have a question. So sure. in, in, in analyzing like the last few um, presentations that you've made on this, um, mm -hmm. beginning with the sentence that you put out, without man, woman is, remember that, and you just moved a mm -hmm. comma, and mm -hmm. then the, the circle graph that you used. Mm -hmm. So all of that is pointing to this and um, saying that rightly dividing the word is even going to come down is going to boil or end with um, us choosing which version of the Bible that we're actually going to use for whatever we want to do, right? Yeah, and it goes a little bit further than that. Even, okay, well, that's as yeah, far yeah. as I got well, so no, far. <laughs> no, but you did good. You did great. Uh, uh, and and in, in addition to that, it's not just the version. It is the prayer life that has to go with it mm -hmm. and the sincere desire to do God's will because those who have wrong motives get wrong interpretations. So, because it's the living word, right? It's not the dead word. That's right. And yeah, yeah. If you're not seeking a closer walk with God. You're just going to find whatever you want to hear. Okay, I just wanted to be sure that I was on um, where yeah, I needed right. to be you're in right. this. No, you good. You good. And I'm just just coming alongside you and adding a little bit more context. Uh, so even with the version, remember the the time setting that our forefathers did that they should have done, right? William Miller, October 22nd, 1844, and they start, kept moving it back. Well, maybe I had the wrong season and maybe I didn't account for this. In the great disappointment, disappointment, the key to building this church was the idea that we have to be wrong. We have to be at fault because God never is. That's good exegesis. That's good hermeneutics. See, somebody with the wrong spirit would say there must be an error in scripture because we had it right. Somebody with the right spirit says, our father is never wrong. So let me talk to him and ask him where we went wrong. People who are good at math know just what I'm saying. <laughs> when you're solving for something, if you can't figure out how you got it, then you're not finished. If you can't reverse it and get it the other way on both sides of that equal sign, then you haven't finished. Good hermeneutics is like good algebra or good calculus. Any other thoughts before we now get into um, get into back into Genesis, back into the story of redemption? Any other comments or questions? Okay, all right. Well, thank you for being so cooperative. Here's where we stopped. Genesis 3, 8. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And so now here is where we introduce clothes, right? Because uh, clothes come from a very uh, emotional place. <laughs> right? uh, it, it, you know, we call it wardrobe. And, uh, you know, uh, Merriam-Webster is not going to go far enough, so you're going to have to do some etymology to see there's two words there. Uh, and you can do it either way you do it, you're still going to come to the same conclusion. Uh, there's war and there's uh, drove, you know, war is internal conflict. And, and of course, uh, drove mm -hmm. is covering. Uh, and so here they are feeling the need to cover themselves because of internal conflict. But you could split it another way, W-A-R-D you know, uh, ward and robe, but you still get the same definition. <laughs> you know? And so basically, this is an unnecessary tragedy that takes place because um, before now, there was joy to hear the voice of the Lord and hear him moving, coming through the garden. And now there's fear and horror. And so let's, let's, let's remember also, I told you in the last lesson that, that Genesis and Revelation are bookends, right? Uh, the Genesis is the beginning of the story of redemption, and Revelation is the conclusion of the story of redemption. In the Revelation 3.18, he's coming the first time when they're in a fallen state, in Revelation 6, he's coming a second time when they're in a fallen state. Here's Revelation 6, 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. You see that? In the garden they're hiding. And then the second coming, they're hiding. And both for the same reason, for fear, because we're not worthy, because we're sinful, because we have disobeyed God and we have no covering. In Genesis, they're innocent, so they have what they feel is a legitimate, legitimate excuse in Revelation they have all of Earth's history and they have no excuse. If you don't have your righteous robe or your wedding garment in Revelation, this your own fault at that point because the gospel has gone into the whole world and everybody who wanted to be can be covered by that righteousness, is, which is the Holy Spirit, which is that sealing, which is all those things we talk about when we're being forgiven and we confessed and we have, we're pressing toward the mark, we will meet him with joy. But if we have neglected the things of God and we refuse to get into the ark of safety, then there's plenty of reasons to be afraid because we are without excuse. Here's Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. And I set my tabernacle among you. You should read the whole Leviticus 26 when we're studying Genesis 3, because it really is a parallel. And I set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Now, the power in that is incredible. These are sinful, fallen people, and they are just having trouble with all these rules. God has given them food laws health laws, social laws, all kind of command, all this. And he says, but I choose to still put my tabernacle in the midst of fallen people and I won't be disgusted by you. As faulty as you are, I love you. Wow. You know what that is? That's God calling us, even though we're fallen. Here's verse 12. 
and I will walk among you. Doesn't that sound familiar? And will be your God and you will be my people. Brothers and sisters, this is after disobedience. The children of Israel come out of Egypt with all these plagues and all these miracles, Red Sea, manna, fire, cloud, uh, giving them water from bitter to sweet. Uh, their clothes aren't wearing out and Moses stays gone too long and what do they do? They enter into an intimate relationship with the devil and they become shameful and fallen and God says, okay, I'm going to come close to you and I'm going to put my tabernacle in the midst of you and I'm still going to love you like you never did it. Man, look, this ain't my sermon, but it could be, <laughs> right? So now we're ready for Genesis 3, 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam. I want you to remember that phrase. And the Lord God called unto Adam. He already knew, right? He knew where they were. He knew what they did. And he's still making his appointment with them. There's a specific place he would normally meet them. They missed the appointment, but he didn't. I need somebody to shout with me right there. <laughs> I wish somebody heard what I said. They missed their appointment, but God Amen. did. They were fallen. They were disobedient. He had told them again and again and again, and they had entered into this covenant with Satan, but God still makes his appointment to meet them at the appointed time. Hmm. He says unto him, where art thou? Story of redemption, lesson two. This is module two. Well, let's talk about our parallel again. John 1 and verse 18 says, no man have seen God at any time. Wait a minute. Didn't we just read God is looking for Adam in Genesis 3, 9? So how is it that no man had seen God at any time? The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. Notice it doesn't say he had declared it. He had declared him. And what that means is Jesus is the expression of the father. Well, I know what you're thinking, Pastor Hood. How do you know? Who told you you knew everything? Well, the question is, which God? Right. So when uh, John 1 18 says God in the beginning of the text, it uses this word theon. Theon is supreme divinity. Same word used in John 3 16 for theos, which is the same as theon, just a different tense. For theos lo so loved the world. <laughs> It's the same word that we use when we, it's the root of the word theology. The uh, ology is thoughts about, theo is God. So when we say theology, it's thoughts about God the Father. And so what is theology? It typically becomes our religion. Whatever we think about God, we express in how we act. Diane, you want to come in on that? So I thought you were saying that Theon meant single God, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, does this connect to uh, when you talked about God? Uh, oh, shoot. Now I got to try to remember. Uh, I know Jesus does the walking and the, the Holy Spirit does the moving. Um, that principle that you had brought to us at one time. Yes. The Father speaks. It speaks and then spirit moves and Jesus walks. So when we're looking back on what you just showed us in the slide before this, mm -hmm. thinking in terms of he hath declared, so the only begotten son, which is the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. No man hath seen God at any time. We know that that's Jesus. But if we have going the slide before that, we know that that's the time that you that principle comes into place where when there mm -hmm. is people that are seeing god are they really seeing jesus because he walked the walk yes jesus is god 
But here there are two distinct personalities here in John 1, 18. No man has seen Theon, the supreme deity, the father, but they have seen his only begotten son, Emmanuel, God with us, Yeshua. These are all expressions of the son. And so all that principle, which you had given to us before, mm -hmm. could have been part, part of the, the, the way the principle was evolved is by knowing things as what we're seeing right now. Correct? Yeah. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Great question. Everybody okay? Uh, oh, I just take it as you're listening intently or feverishly writing, or you're just going to watch this again later. Either way, I'll take it, right? <laughs> so, so uh, yes, supreme divinity, this is singular, meaning the Father. And, and remember, all three are one, but they are three distinct persons. They have different functions. They're all God, okay? So back to our story now. Now, today, I'm introducing uh, one of the books from Spirit of Prophecy I hadn't used yet. Uh, from Eternity Past, page 26, there's a section there called A Sad Change That Sin Produced. The great lawgiver was about to make known to Adam and Eve the consequences of their transgression. In their innocence and holiness, they had joyfully welcomed the approach of their creator. Now they fled in terror. Page 27, Adam cast the blame upon his wife and thus upon God himself. The woman you gave, uh, you know, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. From love to Eve, he had deliberately chosen to forfeit the approval of God and, eat, and an eternal life of joy. So Adam is blaming God indirectly. If you didn't give me this woman, I wouldn't have done it. You made her bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You put me to sleep. You took a rib from my side. You knew that when I saw her, I was going to be sick. I was going to be gone. I was, I was, what do they call that thing? When people just nose wide open, you knew, you knew I would have a thing for her. It's your fault. When the woman asked, was asked, what is this that thou has done? And she answered, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Why did you put that serpent in the garden? Why did, did, didst thou suffer him to enter Eden? These words, these were the questions implied in her first excuse. And so like her husband, she's saying it's your fault. If you wouldn't have let that serpent in there, I would have never been tempted to eat from the tree. It's your fault. Okay. All right. I thought I'd see a bunch of hands, but I'm going to keep going. Self-justification. This is from the book, From Eternity Past, page 27. Self-justification was indulged by our first parents as soon as they yielded to the influence of Satan and has been exhibited by all the sons and daughters of Adam. Do you think this is a correct statement by Ellen White? That this finger pointing, this self-justification, I'm weak, but it's not my fault. Sister Donna. Um, yes, I do. And not, not only that, but I, I'm leaning towards maybe thinking that had they just stood up and said, yeah, we messed up, things might've been a little bit different today. Might've been, might've been. Thank you, Sister Donna. Anyone else? Do you think that this is a correct statement in front of you uh, by Sister White? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Because it even begins in childhood you mm. get caught doing something or somebody else was there and you said they did it, or they made me do it mm. she or he did it we never want to own up to what we did ourselves so mm. we want to make sure that 
we are always justified in what we're doing because it wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Looks like that's all who wanted to talk on that one. So I will, I'm still looking. So I will go on to the next slide. Let me see how much time did I take? Oh boy. Okay. I didn't do too bad. All right. Genesis 3, 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent. Now this is powerful. I, I'm looking at your picture, Brother Parker. So I'm talking to you. This is powerful. God says, what's the meaning of all this? And Adam said, it's that doggone woman you gave me. She was broke. Something was wrong with her. <laughs> and Eve said, it's that snake in the garden. I thought everything was supposed to be good. And God turns to the serpent, meaning that manifestation of the serpent embodied by Satan, and he punishes him first. God does not do family business. <laughs> <laughs> remember last week we said the serpent or satan is an intruder in the home so god does not do family business in front of the intruder did you notice that he deals with the intruder first look I, look i'm gonna have church all by myself tonight lord turns to the serpent genesis 3 14 he says because thou has done this so there was some truth to what Adam and Eve said, right? He, 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 God is acknowledging that they were deceived by the serpent. And he says, he says, because you've done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly. You see those words? Mm -hmm. Shalt thou go. go. Now, those are powerful words. Why are those words powerful? What are they teaching us about the serpent? That he wasn't originally on his belly. Man, you get that right on. I wish I had some candy to throw at you, some a prize or something. But that's exactly what that means. Upon your belly, thou shalt thou, shalt thou go, and dust thou eat all the days of thy life. Sister Audrey. Question. Now, did the serpent have an option of saying no because mm. of this? Uh, well, I don't, I, that's not recorded. Don't yeah, remember. because the way the Lord is saying, thou has done this, he cursed the, the serpent like the ser serpent had an option of saying, no, you can, no I'm to, not doing this no or to not. Satan. Did he have doesn't an say that. No to Satan. Right. Uh, you're right. That's what you're saying. Could, yes. the, could the serpent had said no to Satan? That's an interesting question. Uh, Moses does not get into that. Um, you know, do, do, do animals have free will? You know, I, you know, he doesn't get into uh, that yeah. profession by, by Satan. That's a great you know what, Pastor mm -hmm. Hood, you know what? I can understand what Sister Audrey is saying because mm -hmm. it's implied in the scripture from what God said unto the serpent because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. It's implied that the serpent could have said no or could have resisted the devil in some kind of way. Thinking mm -hmm. back to the beginning of time, animals were not as we see them today. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't even put any thought into this aspect. So that's an interesting question. Y'all going to make me really put some thought into that. Um, wow. Interesting. It's it's funny. It's funny you guys asked that because um, I, I I just texted you, Pastor Hood, saying that it's it's amazing. This I, out of nowhere, I don't know why. Well, the Holy Spirit led me to read this book today. I started. I picked it up today. This book from Eternity to Past, and I started reading it. Um, and when I read that, it's funny. I thought the exact same thing. I said, "This poor serpent. You know, <laughs> did the serpent. This did the serpent have a say in it, in any of this?" Uh, but now that you guys are bringing up that point, you know, especially what you said, Art, in that 
animals weren't what they were then as they are today, it makes me think of, uh, of, of the story of Balaam, uh, where the donkey saw the Holy Spirit and he mm -hmm. responded, he, or he, or he, saw, he, saw, he, saw, he saw God in the form of an angel. He responded. He moved out of the way. He moved to the left, and 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 he he was actually protecting Balaam's life. So, I have not. I, I can't yet reconcile the two thoughts, but there, there there there's more to it that we're gonna have to speak to God about when we get up there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great example because that is an example of an animal saying, "I'm not participating in your sin." Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good, Good point. 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 Uh, Dr. Pam, thank you for raising your hand. Go ahead, Dr. Pam. Yeah, then we, we're talking about morals and moral beings. Animals can't be moral beings, can they? That they, that they would then have free will. That was in our, our Bible study, Sabbath mm -hmm. study. Yeah, but the question here is, what were they originally? Uh, uh, no, you're we right, but I had mentioned something about can animals have free will? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the question was, what were they? And I don't have the answer, by the way. What were they in the garden? What was the depth of their uh, uh, capability or their consciousness or awareness uh, in, in, in the garden? Uh, I mean, it's just a question. It's not really critical to this lesson. But since Audrey brought it up, we'll blame her for whatever comes out of it. Go ahead, uh, Brother Mike. We'll keep talking about it. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, it's like when we raise animals or have animals like dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. They have free will, but yet they obey us. Mm -hmm. The same thing, I believe, applied back then. Mm -hmm. The serpent had to, had to, you know, enough that where it should have obeyed God, but it allowed Satan to use them. Yeah, yeah, I, I haven't, I, I get that because I'm a pet lover. Uh, but in the, um, in this particular lesson, I didn't spend any time thinking about that angle. I appreciate uh, Audrey bringing it up and we're gonna move on because I really have nothing to add to it. I didn't spend any time looking at that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but we, I mean, hey, we were never going to get everything down here, but it is fun to just talk about. So I appreciate everybody. All right. So back to eternity past, from eternity past, sad change that sin produced. Now, get your tissues ready. Page 27, paragraph five. Eve had been happy by her husband's side but she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than God had assigned her. Whoo boy, you know, I get that little feeling my wife's hands start itching. She hadn't said it in a long time. So her hands start itching. She said, we got some money coming or she got some coming. It don't always include me, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I get this little feeling right before I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> I want you to read this line again. <laughs> Eve had been happy by her husband's side, but she was flattered with the hope of entering a higher sphere than God had assigned her. Woo, I got that feeling again. Uh, let me throw this disclaimer in here. This is a woman prophet writing this. This is not Pastor Hood writing. It's woman prophet writing this. I just want you to remember that. <laughs> In attempting to rise above her original position, she fell far below it. Mercy. So we learn some things here. Satan's cunning cannot be overstated. There is, and then also we learn that there are positions in this family. Mm. You, you just stop me when I'm wrong, right? There are positions in this family. They are equal in, a, in importance, but they are not equal in position. A am I correct on that? All right. Yes. Somebody tried to tempt me 
Thank you, Sister Audrey. Somebody tried to tempt me to go into this last week, but I did not take the bait. I did not take it because I knew that it's a whole conversation within itself. They were quoting this book, but they didn't know they were quoting this book. And we're about to get to what they quoted, but we got to set it up. We need context. I'm going back to it again. Eve had been happy. Where? Where was she? This is a place. She was happy because of a place. And where was that place? Her husband's By her side. husband's side. Thank you for preaching that. <laughs> Thank you for preaching that. I'm going to send the offering to you. She was happy by her husband's side, but she was flattered by what? The hope of entering where? A higher place than her husband's side. Is that not what this is saying? Amen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boy, I've heard comedians talk about this, so I'm trying to stay scriptural, so I'm going to stay here. <laughs> right? Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must be her portion. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Let's pause. Her desire was to her husband until... She was presented with the option of going higher. And let me translate. And I'm glad y'all can't hit me through the computer, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> she was good until the thought of something better came along. Ooh, mercy. Ooh, what time is it? I might need to end this lesson right here. The grass <laughs> looked greener on the other side. Lord have mercy. I didn't say that. That was Brother Parker, Brother Art Parker. <laughs> uh huh. She was good until, until the proposition of something more was presented to her. Then good wasn't good enough. Sister Diane, go right ahead. Sometimes I wonder if they say that's like a false euphoria. What that's do you mean? not that it's it's thinking that you're going to have something more than what you a betterment that's a lie. Mm -hmm. she, mm -hmm. She's she's believed in a lie. Yes, and Satan crafted that lie. He he could have said a lot of things to her, but he crafted the hope, that false hope, he crafted it. Uh, is that Veronica, Sister uh, Watts? I can't tell. It's it's me, Pastor Veronica. Ooh, um, you know, I always hear this saying that all that glitter is not gold. You know, so he dangled all this in front of her, and she found out that you know it ended up taking her to um, causing her to lose that relationship there with God, because um, you know. She thought that was something was going to elevate her, you understand? But it opened her eyes to disobedience to what God told her not to do. So yeah. all that glitters is not really gold. And some of us chase that for the wrong things in life. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Ooh, boy, I got that feeling. Just Diane, go ahead. <laughs> so from what we learned last week, it broke an order. It broke mm -hmm. an order that God had created. Yeah, correct? That, that is correct. And that's why I've been hesitating because we're about to get into that. And just as we talked about hermeneutics a moment ago, it is a struggle for us to separate the culture of the day from the text in front of us. All of us, Every last one of us on this line live and those who will listen in the past have been affected by the ideals of feminism. And so it can cause us to feel that something being said isn't right or we can be offended by what is said, not really absorbing what's being said. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy continues 
to stress the importance and the relevance of the woman and the love of the woman by God. And yet when we get to this part of the story, a defensiveness uh, sometimes swells up. So often people will say to me, uh, do I have to say honor and obey in these marriage vows? Well, no, you don't have to, your marriage, you say what you want to say. <laughs> you know. But that question comes not because they don't love the person they're about to marry, but because of this fall, it set man and woman at odds against one another. And so our natural state that God put in order becomes the enemy, but God put it in order. So we tend to have this issue that we love God whom we can't see, but we have apprehension toward the man that we do see. And those two things don't go together. Jesus even asked that question. How can you convince me that you love your brother, sister, person in front of you? Uh, I mean, that you love God, but you hate the person in front of you. See, that, that uh, feeling of being threatened by this order is not natural. It's implanted and fused in us by our culture. Okay, I didn't see no hands pop up, so I'm living to fight another day. So let me read this slide and see if I can land this plane and get out of here unscathed. <laughs> right. Eve was told of the sorrow and pain that must be her portion. And now the next thing here is a direct quote from the scripture. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Question. Why does God need to tell Eve to desire her husband? Can I get in? Yes, you can. Okay. He, okay. A little bit earlier, you were talking about scribes and you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, oh, okay. I'm looking at the King James Version. Okay, which is usually the one that they refer back to. And some of these things we're saying today are not in the King James Version, such as, for one thing, the Bible says the serpent was more subtle than any beast, B-E-A-S-T, of the field, okay? In the book of Revelations, it talks about the mark of the beast. And that same devil that tempted Eve is tempting us in the last days. He has always, he has never changed. And in the King James Version, it says, and the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and one, a tree to, do, uh, to make one wise. And it said she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her. And he did eat. We always say she wandered away. She should have stayed there. The Bible, the King James Bible said he was there. Why didn't he stop her, you know? Now, I think the serpent, God allowed Satan to enter this beast of the field, which is now the serpent, because he had to test them. I think they were new. He wasn't going to just assume they would always be faithful. He gave them, in other words, he allowed them to be tempted. And, they, and all of this stuff about he's supposed to be over her and all this stuff that he told her after she sinned about bearing her children in pain. The Bible does not say that Eve knew anything about that at all. The Bible says in the very next verse, and the eyes of them both were open. He put fig leaves on, she put fig leaves on. He went and hid, she went and hid. 
I bleed since she was taken from her side. She was exactly what Adam said. She was bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And I think God loved them regardless because they were created in his image. When he looked at them, when he looks at me and you, he sees himself. And man is fearfully and wonderfully made because he was made in the image of God. Okay. I'll let you go. And okay. I didn't mean to get in here to whip you today, but Pastor. But no, I you just, whip I just, you whip me because I, I had a question for you. you. I was so trying I, to. I was quiet because I couldn't tell where you were going. We're at the punishment and you went back to the creation. Are you trying to excuse her sin or not? No, I, I, I'm not excusing her or him. To okay. me, they both sin. The Bible says the eyes of them both were open. They okay. both sin. Okay. okay. And uh, until that time, there's no place in the Bible that says, that she's supposed to have been following him all through the garden and asking him what you, or he was her boss. And now we know what happened <laughs> after him. After well, him. Well, I'm going to make my point, right? I'm going to make my point right after I finish this section here. And I'm going to clear that up for you because that seems to be a tough spot for you. Right, uh, it sure does. <laughs> But I will say simply this at this moment, the fact that she received a punishment implies that she was aware of her choices. Uh, yeah. God doesn't punish people who aren't aware of their choices. Would you, would you agree with that? Why would God punish her for something when she had no I, idea? She wasn't punished. I don't think she was punished because she ate the apple. She was punished because she knew that there was something different about this one tree. She could eat of all the trees. This one, she was not to go near it. And I hear people said, oh, he didn't say she couldn't touch it. King James Virgin said he told her, don't touch it. Okay. But anyway, um, they, they both, I don't think both of them knew. I think Adam knew. I think Adam was deceived. Eve was not deceived. So God is wrong then, right? He God is never wrong. God is never wrong. But, okay. he has but, I, but then what is the point of what you're saying? If he punished both of them, then they both were guilty of something. Absolutely. Uh, and the, but it wasn't an eating some, fruit. It wasn't eating fruit. They <laughs> were guilty of disobeying him. He yeah. told them not to go near that tree. Don't touch it. They knew not to do it. Maybe she didn't know she'd bear all her kids in pain and he would have to work and be a farmer the rest of his life. He didn't know all the consequences which yeah. he learned after God went to the garden where they were. But before then, I think they were both perfect. They were both equal. They were both made in the image of God. And the Bible says the eyes of them both were open. And then they knew that they, they, they knew good and evil. I don't think when she went to that tree, she knew evil. So she didn't sin then? Yes, she did sin. She didn't if sin she because sinned, she ate the sinned. apple. She <laughs> did sin. She disobeyed God. Right. Okay? Right. Disobedience. Right. When, you, when you go contrary to what God told you to do, you sin. He who knoweth to do good and do it not, do him it is sin. Adam and Eve knew they were not to go to that tree. They went anyway. So that's why they sinned. Not because they ate an apple, because they still eat apples. Well, I think the slides after this one is going to clear it up for you. Okay. Okay, we'll see okay. What I'll be quiet and let you finish. No, you fine. I, I have some other comments here. We're going to go there. Dr. Pan? Yes, as far as him saying, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. 
Although the husband is going to rule over her, she will not be unhappy because she's going to have a natural desire and longing and love for her husband. And I think that's why he said, thy desire shall be to thy husband so that she will have that natural desire to love and be with her husband. Yeah. Well, Dr. Pam, I want to thank you for answering the question that I asked. That is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it really is. And, and so, and I like your answer. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. Remember that first illustration we had, that sentence I gave, and people read it different ways? This, is, this shows progress. I might have a teardrop here. This shows progress here. Don't read into the text, accept the text for what it is saying. Because it's attached to a punishment, this sounds like a punishment, but maybe it's just a statement of fact. I didn't deal with the last part, only this part. God says, thy desire shall be to thy husband. Dr. Pam says, she's going to have a natural uh, desire for her husband. I like that answer. Uh, Dr. Hans. <laughs> just really quickly, I uh, just wanted to clarify, uh, God did not tell them not to touch the tree, um, whether you're reading in the King James Version or the New King James Version in chapter two, God specifically told them that they shall, they shall not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't tell them that they're not allowed to touch it. Now, was that said and you know, God decided to leave it out of the book of Genesis? I don't know, but the Bible does not state that God told them that they cannot touch the tree. That's how the devil in, in, in his exceeding cunningness, that's how he was able to trap Eve. Mm -hmm. God said, don't eat, don't eat of it. Don't touch it or you'll die. So now he gives her the fruit. And he's like, look, hey, you touched it. You didn't die. Now you're going to tell me if you take a little bite, you're going to die too. That's how he sowed the seeds of doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And then quickly regarding the Bible, not sp explicitly stating that they were separated you have to realize that the conversation is happening between Eve, whether I, I can't tell you spatially where they were. I have to assume that they were not within the immediate proximity to each other because the conversation is strictly happening between the serpent and Eve. Mm -hmm. Eve is doing the talking and then turns around and gives to Adam. Uh, so I, I, again, the Bible doesn't specifically state that they're not around, but I think it's safe to assume that she wasn't within the immediate proximity because the, the, Adam is not involved in that conversation at all. Yeah. Pastor, and, I just want to give the text. In Genesis 3, 3, in that verse, I'm looking at it right now. And God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. Anybody listening, look in your own Bible and I'm going to leave it alone. I go to the Bible. But who, 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 is, who is saying that, though? Is that God saying that? God is it not says God said. No, it doesn't. God said, no, yes, no, it does. no, no, no. In no, the Genesis 3, 3, I'm looking at it in the yes. King No, that's not. But the that's woman, not what the woman is saying that. Eve is the right. one talking. She's, right. she's that's not God misquoting speaking. God. That's a misquote. That is not God talking. This is the conversation between the serpent. Oh, okay. And, Eve is saying, yeah, that's God right. has said, you're yeah, right. God mystery. has said, ye shall not eat of it. That's Neither right. shall you touch it lest you die. Eve did say that God said that to he her. He added to what God said. Somebody in the panel brought this up last week. when we That was me. Out. That was me, Pastor. Yes. All right. All right. We good now. It's all good. Uh, Sister Gladys, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, that was me that said that about the uh, thing, but it doesn't matter. Pastor, you had said that Moses didn't say it. And so, because we weren't there to know what Moses had said and your answer sort of threw me for a loop, what you had said. But to answer your question, the, um, the, God is, is right there in the next verse. It says that God had made her equal to Adam, but sin has yeah, separated I'm getting to that. I'm getting to it. And that's it. why, that's <laughs> why they said that her desire was going to be to her husband. They mm -hmm. were equal. The desire wasn't there to, uh, for him to rule over her. She was his, his, his equal, his helpmate, his help meet at the time before sin came in. And it took on a different relationship. Their relationship took yeah. on a different dynamic when sin entered in. 
did it? Yes, it did. I think that she became, um, he was able to rule over her before he wasn't ruling over her. Okay, well, let me ask you something. What does God making her equal to Adam look like? What does that look like? You're asking me? Mm-hmm. I, I'm, and I'm just think this is only my own thoughts that she helped in uh, finishing naming the flowers, naming the trees, naming the animals, um, helping to tend the garden. Because I believe the garden wasn't a small garden. It was a big, huge place be where he was able it's because of the rivers that flow through it yeah, and i believe yeah. pardon four of them and all the animals fit in there yeah. yeah and so it was pretty large and he was her she was his help meet um mm -hmm. to um make things work to tend the garden to make it even more beautiful oh, okay i just want to know what your perception of that is uh, thank you brother parker go ahead she answered the question, and I was going to say that God made her equal to Adam in intelligence. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding. All right. Are you done? Okay. Elder Hood. You know, I think about um, what happened with Eve as to why she found herself in this situation from the beginning in reference to in a position where the serpent had her attention. So as you stated prior to this slide, flattery, she was flattered. So her affections were not just with her husband, something else caught her attention, got her attention so much to the point where it caused her to be disobedient and not only cause her disobedience, but to, to bring that to her husband and in turn cause him to become disobedient. So that's what I thought about when I saw before you just changed the, um, the slide here. Can I go back to the one I was at? I'll go back. Yeah, in reference to thy desire shall be to that husband, so getting back to um, the the original intent or the original relationship, the original desire, and what her focus was in reference to her relationship with her husband, because at some point something happened to cause her, you know, and we can think about our own relationships, you know. So I see it as just re going back to her first love. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So let's let's um, let's go here. Okay. Because there's some you know disagreement among us about what this relationship looked like prior to the fall. So if I'm going to take at face value that nobody was in charge, that they were equal in every way, I'm just going to do it that way. And I'm going to go back to the hands. I'm going to take it that way. If they are equal in every way, nobody's in charge, then how do you explain what's in front of you? She was flattered with the hope of entering what? A higher sphere than God had assigned her. In attempting to rise above her original position, is that not rising above Adam? Oh, Lord. Yes, Sister it Donna. is. Sister Donna, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I believe it is. Um, but but I wanted to say that the whole um, her desiring him and all that, we have to remember why Eve was created. See, God mm. God created her to be a help me for him. Mm. Okay. And so if she was going to be a help me, that meant right there that she had to at least be equal to him in order to be able to even help him. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, everybody, I've, I've been a manager, a supervisor on several jobs, and I needed plenty of help, but none of them wasn't equal to me. Yeah, but you didn't have God. <laughs> oh, <he did> you. <laughs> ah! oh no, you didn't have God. <laughs> no. 
no, no, I'm just making the point that but somebody doesn't have to be equal to you to help you. No, but I'm saying that God made her to be a help me to him. So yeah. how are you gonna help somebody if you you know if you're not at least where they are? Okay. You know? All right, I ain't gonna argue with you. But I'll I mean that's that's where I think the whole it. thing is coming from. We have to remember why God made her as a help okay. me. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to let these people talk, but I just want to give you a rhetorical question, food for thought. I don't know who that need to mute themselves with the humming. I don't know who that is. Uh, sounds like a, some radio in the background, a humming. We're recording. Yeah, there's some humming going on. And if you're not talking, please go ahead and mute yourself. That's 9198. I can't. The way I got the presentation in front of me is hard for me to see. Okay, they did it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I know we have some hands. I'm going to go to you, Dr. Hans, and then Sister Hood. But before I go, I want to give you a rhetorical question. The fact that two weeks in a row, this conversation is such a trigger tells you that we're out of order. This, this conversation should not trigger us the way that it is, but it does. And, and it gives me good, something good to teach with, but it is an issue. Uh, Dr. Hans, go right ahead. He, no? Uh, yeah, real, real, really, really quickly, um, the, uh, just, I'll, ans I'll, I'll just uh, answer Dr. Uh, Sister Donna's uh, question when, or comment where she said, how can you be the help if you're not on the same page? And that's sort of the very definition of the help, if you will. It's actually used sometimes as a derogatory term. You know, oh, they're just the help. Um, that being the help doesn't necessarily place you on the same level as the person who you are helping. Um, as And Pastor would give a good example. There are plenty of people who help. I, as a doctor, I have nurses who help me. Um, the nurses have, you know, nursing assistants who help them. The nursing assistants have nursing students who help them. You know, not everyone is on the same level. And then coming back to your original question, Pastor, when I first read this, excuse me, and I, I read this today, funny enough, the first thing that came to mind was I didn't think of it in the, in, in, from the gender perspective. I thought of it from the standpoint of entering a higher sphere the way Lucifer tried to enter a higher sphere. He tried to surpass his position. Uh, so maybe trying to enter into a sphere of, you know, higher, uh, of a higher level of being. Um, and in essence, if you think about it, that I, I guess now that I think about it, that's also surpassing Adam in the sense that Adam wasn't created in that sphere either of a higher being. And so, yeah, I, I guess in that sense, yes, yeah, she's surpassing him. She's surpassing where God placed her, not just on the realm of, you know, uh, uh, on, on the realm of Adam versus Eve, but, you know, Eve versus God. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And yep. Elder Hood. <laughs> Thinking of it from a more practical perspective, you know, I am Mrs. Hood. And when we married, when I said I do, the Bible says you shall, he told you leave and cleave and become one flesh. I am his help me. It does not mean that though I am his help me, I'm not the one that's responsible for um, doing the things that he, he does. You know, I'm a home, so how do I help him? I help him by making sure the house is clean, that the kids are clean, that the meal is on the table, that when he gets home, everything is in order. That's my role. That's my job as his help me. Uh, he's the pastor. We're one flesh. So I'm his eyes, his ears, so things, you know, so from that perspective, not that um, I am above him or or my role because I am his helpy, help meet is of less value. My value and my worth has been assigned to me just by virtue of being his help me. And I embrace that role. So when it comes to what I believe the Bible is saying about Adam and Eve, it's no different because if my life is, if I'm living according to the scripture, then it's not about you know, a power struggle. It's about what mm -hmm. role do I take on as being the help me of my household? And so, yeah, that's what I think about in terms of he's the pastor, but though he's the pastor, God did not 
I'm, I'm still to help me, but I'm not trying to pastor Southeast. You know, I am to embrace the place that God you has called us. Walk through that sisterhood. You could have walked huh? right through that door and say, look, if we're equal, then yeah, then I should be able to pass, here. right? <laughs> yeah. But, but okay, so so when I so when it's it's put in this perspective, most mm -hmm. people would say, You're not the pastor, this he's the would. pastor. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What's, what I'm sorry, what did you say? No, no, I was amen you. Go ahead. No, I so, no, I just think about it from that perspective. So if I'm his help me, then I am to. Yeah, the thing, I don't want to repeat myself, but yeah, from yeah, just... This is, a, this is a perfect example of worldliness coming into the church. There's nothing derogatory or beneath, or it doesn't belittle, since you used us as an example. It does not, it's not negative for sisterhood to be my help me. It doesn't belittle her. There are people who will say, take today grave. She's a better preacher. And you know what, Pastor Hood, <laughs> just to interrupt yeah, you, yeah. and I have my, I have a degree just like he has a degree. I've gone back to school for another degree, yet he is still, you know, the I am still in my role as the help me. Yeah, and that is not a less important role. See, we're treating it like that because we're bringing our culture to the text. It's not an unimportant role. It is vital. One cannot live without the other. You see, and, and, and sometimes I think that Satan, as I think Sister Whitlock said, is still wielding that same dissension right now. It's just not fruit, it's position. Because remember, in attempting to rise above her original position. Uh, Dr. Pam, go ahead. I don't want you to forget what you're going to say. <laughs> okay. So yeah, the Bible says, uh, he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Oh, I'm going so, there. I, I knew you was going to do that. Go ahead. I, 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 I had that coming up. <laughs> so he was, she was rewired <laughs> to ride for man. And uh, it says, womb man, womb man, womb man, and also yeah. the other word was ish for man and isha for woman mm -hmm. as a derivative mm -hmm. implying that there is a superiority of man over woman because we were derived out of the man. And, and, and I guess uh, Adam knew that divinely in the Garden of Eden and that's how God did it. <laughs> well, you see, that's a very good point. And um God was intentional in how he did it. He could have shaped a new thing from the ground, but he wanted them to be one flesh. Ooh-wee. I'm going to stop here because I got in the next, in the next couple of slides, we only got a couple more to go. Is that Sister Veronica or Sister Watts? It's me, Pastor. I just want to ask this question, right? Um, I know that Adam and Eve was his helpmate, but... Doesn't the Bible say that the husband was the head of the wife? Yeah. As Christ is the head. So, I mean. Yeah. But that doesn't really <laughs> fall there. Because that doesn't have anything to do with him being yes, above her. I've been telling you from the beginning that these are bookends. Oh. The, we're dealing with the new create, uh, with the original creation. And when we get to the New Testament, everything from the first creation will be restated again. It just, it, sometimes it's in a different way, but it's clear that God is restating his point because he does not change. If God says in Ephesians that the man is the head of the wife, it's not because he had a revelation. <laughs> he's restating what he's already said. And there's a reason for it, and it is not intelligence. I like the fact that Dr. Uh, somebody, uh, Brother, Brother Parker brought that out. It is not intelligence. Clearly, we see that with me and Sisterhood. It ain't got nothing to do with intelligence. It has something to do with purpose. And if you're not sure, look at the physique of men and women, and you will see purpose. 
So Dr. Uh, Pam just brought out womb. That is a purpose. Muscle density and mass is a purpose. God knows the end from the beginning. Sister Donna, I thought some other hands were up, but Donna's the one left standing. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, um, to ask you then, <clears throat> because your original question was pertaining to what it meant, what we thought it meant when, for God to make Eve equal to Adam. That was presented no, that in wasn't one my of question. Your, my no, question that, was, why did he say to her, thy desire shall be to thy husband? Why did he say that? Well, that in one of your question. previous slides, there was... Mm -hmm. uh, something pertaining to the God made them equal at first? It's in the same slide. People were skipping ahead of me. <laughs> oh, okay. See, it's okay. right here underneath okay. what and, I was dealing with. Okay, and that's what made me go to um, the, the original reason why God said he made her, because he needed to help me. You went to the right place. I'm okay. just going to change okay. the way you see it. That's all. Okay. You went in the right place. You good? Everybody's good. I, I'm not there's no adversity here. We just working it out. This is like a good, if you want to know what happens in seminary, this is one of the classes that everybody show up at because it's a good conversation. Okay, so we have in seminary at home. That's what we're doing. Dr. Hans, go ahead. One thing I, I that I always try to use sort of as a, a barometer for where I should be or where we should be as Christians is where we are in the world today. Uh, the Bible tells us which way the world is going to head. It's going to head further away from how God uh, had originally intended it. And you just look around, look at the things that are going on now. And the Bible mm -hmm. tells us as clear as day that they're going to get worse. Everything was, I, I guess, okay. And then you start with the, fem the, the feminist movement. Uh, then you start with, you know, women in power and women in politics. And I'm not, I'm not against it. I'm not a, 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 a don't apologize, <laughs> man. Say it with your chest. Don't apologize. No, no, I, 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 I got no problem saying it with my chest. What I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a bunch of windows, my cheese mold, my, my, my misogynist type of men. But the more and more I look at it, the more and more I'm seeing that we are as a, as a people, as a human race, just oh, stepping boy. further and further and further <laughs> away from whatever God had planned for us. And the world we know is now, it now belongs to the devil. When, 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 when he was able to, to sort of get Adam to sin, Adam gave up his dominion over mm -hmm. the earth to the devil. The, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the earth became the devil's. Everything that we, when we look at everything that we're doing in this earth, if it's not something that's coming from the word of God, that's drawing us closer to him and, and, and building us spiritually, mm -hmm. it's going to be of the devil. And all these things that we're doing, it's if we stop for a second, take a deep breath, and then go back to the beginning, right as they left the Garden of Eden, mm. God assigned both of them their roles. And like you said, mm -hmm. in Revelation, it's not because God's, oh, wait, I forgot, to, I forgot to, no, that he's just repeating what he said in the beginning. Yes. Uh, and it's just a, a matter of spiritual maturity. Uh, before one can come to that in life. Same for me. It's not, I'm not saying it like I've, I've reached, but it's the, you, you, you have to get there. You have to grow spiritually to get and get there and see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we speak as if Eve got punished and Adam got rewarded. And that's not what took place. <laughs> but anyway, I'll get to that in a minute when we move past this slide. Diane, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to reiterate from what um, um, Hans said, and that is, so the reason why we're having this dialogue is because we are living separated from, mm -hmm. from uh, you know, from, from the time of the, the mm -hmm. sin and from the text originally. So it's good to do this, as you're saying, to dissect it so we get back to where we need to be. That's Excellent. what I'm hearing. Is that, that is, what I'm hearing? You are right on the money. Excellent. Amen, Diane. Amen. This Amen. is excellent. Excellent point. Uh, Dr. Pam, go right ahead. So if you look at the Trinity, and mm. <laughs> call each other, call equal, but different functions. Come on and preach, sister. <laughs> preach it. Preach it. Go ahead. You have the floor. I'm going to mute me for you. Go ahead. Speak on that. You you done? Yeah, I just you know that you know you have, you have Jesus, God mm. the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, co-eternal, co-equal, but they have different functions, and so 
the same I, try, I literally tried to plant that seed in this conversation. It seemed a little out of sorts when I did it, when I brought it up, when I talked about Theon. Remember that? I tried to plant that seed in the conversation because I want us to remember that we are made in God's Elohim, plural. Remember I said that? Yes. We're made in his image, which does not lessen the importance of the Son or the Holy Spirit, but Theos is the divine uh, supreme di divinity, but ain't nobody mad in the Godhead. Ain't nobody mad. Because everybody has embraced, as Sister Hood said, their role, because that's what they were built to, that's what they, this is what I was made to do. I, I, I tried to provoke you here, and I, 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 I'm not mad at anybody. You should, nobody should feel bad because I provoke you on purpose. And let me just prophesy for you. Somewhere in just about every lesson, I'm going to provoke you. <laughs> right? This thing, thy desire shall be to thy husband. Nobody said Adam's desire is to his wife. But it is okay. Sisterhood, you said that? Yeah. Oh, okay. She and she not she not her mic is not on. But yes, that's a I didn't I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. But that was I was I looking. Said it, but I I, I oh, okay. I'll let you finish. I I was No, no, okay, it's fine. I I, I just missed it, I guess. You know, but I was listening for the that. The reason why <laughs> the feminist movement was needed. Because in so many parts of the world, the woman has to be covered up. She has to walk behind her husband. The only women in America that wasn't doing it, what, what they call the American Jewish princess. And I think it's because she, they were Jews that they feel more equal to the man. Jesus said when he was here, there's neither male nor female, uh, 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 um, Christian or Jews or whatever, that we're all equal. And yeah. that's why the feminist movement came up. I know that we're not saying the feminist movement tonight, but mm -hmm. I just have to defend yeah. a woman since I'm a woman, okay? Okay, well, but... I know plenty of women who don't like the feminist movement. Then the, neither male or female, Greek nor Jew, is in being saved. You know, All right. can be saved. It's not about uh, God doesn't make a distinction between those things. He does not discriminate against Absolutely. someone who wants to be saved. So the- Don't misunderstand the, me. I like being a lady. I like a man opening doors and doing all that. And I don't want to be the one to make all the money and stuff like, and have the babies, okay? So wow. I'll just <laughs> go back to where we were right. before. All but right. um, I still say that in the beginning, and it says here, God made Eve equal to Adam before sin. Now we're saying what happened after sin in Ephesians and all of that. But we were in Genesis. Okay. Begin when we started. That's why I said what I said. I, I and got men it. and I... women have sin. And woman's desire is to her husband and men like women just as much as men, <laughs> women like men. I'll just leave that. Yeah, well, that's what I was looking for is that his desire is for his wife. It pleases him, a godly man anyway. It pleases him to care for her. This is not a one-sided thing, right? Uh, all right, if we ever get to the next slide, I'll make my point. Uh, go ahead, Sister Diane. If somebody didn't gave up the ghost, go ahead, Diane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just thinking that, because I'm trying to think about the process we're going through and, and what, mm -hmm. it, what it's creating. And I found myself thinking also the question you gave last week. And I'm thinking he is starting us, he is. <laughs> but I think the questions we have in regard to trying to understand this is part mm -hmm. of what we have to understand in each other as we're doing this mm -hmm. as well. 
Yeah. So, and, and I'm doing, I'm saying this because I'm trying to find a way to know that when we come together and we don't have to feel bad about what we're saying, we don't no, have to feel no. that we're right or that we're wrong, or we're trying to please you or, or anything. Right. All, we're coming together and we're asking the questions openly and honestly, so we can get to a point where we know our creator more. And we can know the Godhead more and how we do relate to the image and how we're being called back. Um, but this is what I needed to say in order to make sure that I'm articulating the direction we're going into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is critical because the story of redemption is not an egotistical thing where God set us up to fall so that he can show how benevolent he is. He, he's not a self-serving God. What he does, he does for us and for all of creation because he loves us. Um, remember this, this verse I showed you earlier that didn't seem to fit. I'm gonna go back to it and then I'll, I'll get back here. Um, Let's see here. Leviticus uh, 26, 11 and 12. Remember, I set it up. I said, Moses stayed up there too long and they went into sin. And God comes after this and says, and I set my tabernacle among you and my soul. This is God talking. And my soul shall not abhor you. I'm not, even though you are wrong, I'm not disgusted by you. I want to be near you. I will walk among you and we will, and, and will be your God and you shall be my people. You see, the person on trial is not Adam and Eve. The person on trial is God. Because Satan got so unruly that finally, after a long period of time, he had to be expelled out of heaven. And he has been sowing these lies about God ever since. God is on trial. And he recognizes that. And that's why in the garden, he addresses the serpent first. He addresses him first because he knows who uh, the problem is, let me get back to where, where we were. Okay. And, uh, maybe I should just go on and land the plane because I have not been looking at the time I normally do. Uh, but this was a long one tonight and I hope that it's okay with you guys. Uh, because the story of redemption will get off to a bad start. If we're suspicious of God's motives which is exactly the seed that the devil um, was sowing, is that you should be suspicious of God's motives. If, if the relationship between Adam and Eve is not clear, between them and God is not clear, then in some unintentional way, we're kind of saying Satan had a point. Okay? All right, so let's get back to, to where we were. I really wanted to hammer this home. Eve had been happy by her husband's side. The reason this looks better to us than your desire shall be to your husband is because of our biases, because that is no different than this happy by her husband's side before the fall is the same as be by your husband's side after the fall. This portion is not a punishment. Rule over you and watch over you are the same in this verse. Your husband shall rule over you is that your husband shall now be charged to look after you. Y'all don't hear me preaching up in here. I'm gonna send around a virtual collection plate. Somebody about to get free up in here. 
God had, you see, there's no re, there's, there's a reason this sentence comes after that by Sister White. God had made her the equal of Adam, but sin brought what? Discord. And now their union could be maintained and harmony uh, preserved only, only by submission on the part of one or the other. Why could it only be maintained by submission now? The previous uh, uh, paragraph told us she was attempting to rise above her original position. And now I'm gonna say it to you plainly. Being equal wasn't enough when she was tempted. The problem wasn't that she was less, the problem was that being equal wasn't enough. And that plays out again and again today. People always say, a lot of ladies say this, I want to be, I don't want to be subservient to my husband. I want to be equal. And then he says, okay, and what does she start doing? She started bossing him around because she didn't really want to be equal. She wanted to be the head. Lord have mercy. Get, let me get back to this verse and I'm going to prove something to y'all and then I'm done because two hours is pretty long, right? Genesis 2.18, and the Lord said, God said, it is not good that the man should be what? Alone. I will make him and help meet. Well, the question is, what is that? Ellicott's commentary. In Hebrew, a help as his front his reflected image, or as the Sirach translates it, a helper similar to him. The happiness of marriage is based not upon the woman being just the same thing as the man, because that would be gay, <laughs> right? But upon her being one in whom he sees his image and counterpart. So help me in short is a counterpart, a partner, right? The first marriage from eternity past, I'm back to spirit of prophecy now, page 17. This is flipping the pages back. God gave Adam a companion and help me for him, one who was fitted. What does fitted mean? <laughs> right? She was prepared to be his companion. She was equipped with everything she needs to be his companion. And I don't think any little kids are on here, but just use your imagination, right? One's an any, one's an Audi. <laughs> right? Preach, preacher. One has preacher. caps, one does not. Preacher. One got rough lips, one got sweet lips. One got good hips, one has no hips. They're not the same, they complement one another. They celebrate their differences instead of feel slighted by their differences. Feeling slighted by your differences is not biblical. God doesn't have anything to do with that. Feeling like you got a bad rap is not biblical. That's just a serpent still talking. That's all it is. Their desire is for one another. Look at this. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam. She was not to, this is the same lady y'all quote to tell me God said they're equal. This is the same lady in the same book. Right, you can't get no better than that. She was not to control him. Ah, the serpent beguiled or convinced Eve. And what did Eve turn and do? Come on, somebody tell me. What did Eve turn and do? Talk to me, somebody. I don't hear nobody. <laughs> what did Eve turn and do after the serpent convinced her? Because her eyes were open at this point. She, she, turned, this apple, she turned and convinced and Eve, Adam. <laughs> she turned and convinced Adam. That's yeah. right. She was out of 
order. And by listening to her, he was out of order. Was never created to work that way. She was not to lead him around. He was to watch for her soul. That's somebody who's a good head of household, not a boss, a tyrant, or somebody like Sister Whitlock said, walk behind me and shut up and wear these long clothes. That's not what God is talking about at all. What God is talking about is he was to watch for her soul. I know. He's the strong man that was bound by his affection toward his wife. Look, look at the balance here. Haven't y'all heard me since the day you met me talk about balance? She was not to control him as the head, nor be trampled under his feet as an inferior. You see that? That's what it means to be by his side. He doesn't see her and say, ooh, I can easily take advantage of her. He sees her and says, I'm supposed to take care of her. Right. See? We're, we're spoken of sometimes as men as if we're not supposed to be godly. That's stuff that these men do, and you're rightfully so. Men have been a great disappointment in this regard. But those men who have been a great disappointment are not what God intended. They're not godly men. Godly men want to please God, and by doing so, they want to take care of their wives. So when we talk, we're talking about the ideal of what God intended, not about what faulty men do. Okay, Dr. Pam. Yeah, so when you, you look again at the original language, uh, the word for help is Ezer. And when you look at other parts of the Bible, when it talks about the Lord is my help and my salvation, they use that same word, either. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, so being a helpmate the, is, is not something that's bad. It's something that's good. Right. <laughs> it, is, it does not imply inferiority. It implies that one cannot make it without the other. That God created such a situation where we would need one another. Brother Parker. And that is why God had put Adam as the head and their eyes were not open until Adam, who was the head and the leader, broke the law. Hmm. God could have easily made another Eve if Adam had not followed the lead of his wife and remained the head that he was appointed to be as was his part or his job that God assigned to him. His assignment was to lead, not to follow. Well, well, all right. Okay. So we're at the end here and I'm thank you for hanging around because this is, please tell other people about the master keys. I hope that it has been a blessing to you and, um, and it has your mind turning. You know, if your mind is turning, that means it's been great, All right? Genesis 3, 17, and unto Adam, he said, and the next word is because. Adam has not been encouraged or validated for listening to his wife. Whatever is going to happen to Adam now, his punishment. Remember, we were talking like Adam got rewarded and Eve got punished. <laughs> he got hey, he got the headship. He won out. No, that ain't what God. How God is talking. He says, "Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of your wife, this is not a good thing." His wife had made a covenant with Satan. <laughs> and, and she didn't, you're right. She didn't know all the implications of that, but she knew that it was forbidden. And because Adam followed suit, because he did the same thing, hardship is coming now. 
now were for four where God made it easy to watch for her. He only had to do one thing to watch for her soul. Now it's going to be exponentially harder to accomplish because now the very earth that was laid at your feet, you got to fight with it to survive. And ain't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Before they could be together all the time because his job then required them to be separated. But now he has to go and subdue this same earth that was good. Mercy. Ephesians 5.29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, even as the Lord, the church. Amen. See that? This is how a godly man is supposed to see things. No, now, in Ephesians 5, ain't nothing in here about how much money we make or what kind of family we came from. One is more prestigious than the other or what our titles are away from home. Ain't none of that here. It's about this man seeing this woman as his own flesh. Just as God didn't separate himself from us in Leviticus 26, we don't do that to our wife. Okay, that concludes how far we're going. In the next module, we're gonna talk about the two things, the only two things that Adam and Eve took from the garden. And I look forward to talking about that. Perhaps somebody already know what those two things are. But we're going to talk about that on next Tuesday. All right. We have went all into overtime. So let's have a word of prayer and we're going to stop the recording. Lord, thank you for a great discussion with the panel tonight. I pray, Lord, that this word goes out like seeds, that it create discussions in homes and in churches everywhere, because we really need to get in alignment with what you intended and not have um issues with doing things the way that you desired for us uh lord we ask that um you bless us that you forgive us for what we don't understand and we should what we don't know and just help us along so that we can become one as a family we thank you in jesus name amen and amen